going over the uh, connection between faith and reason. And uh, we spent some time on the question of faith. Then we're going to get into reason uh, as we proceed forward. Hopefully we'll get into that tonight. But what I'd like to do is to cover a few more fundamental aspects of this question of faith. And uh, we said that what we needed was both faith and reason. And the operative or key word is the word and, not either or. And uh, we said that the idea of faith involves us in divine revelation. Okay. Now this divine revelation uh, is God, which is which is really unique. Uh, you know, we tend to read these things like when you open the Bible and uh, you read Genesis. Uh, this was an entirely new notion and concept of God. That God would somehow reveal himself to the human person, to human beings, to a people. That God was always distant, away, different. And yet, before the fall, we have God, as Genesis tells us, who walks in the cool of the evening. That's how intimate the relationship is before sin. Now, this, this was a shock to the entire Mesopotamian world. Uh, gods didn't do those things. Gods kind of either did their thing and left because they didn't want to get contaminated with human beings or they had other things to do. But now you have a God who intimately reveals himself and that intimacy is in the cool of the evening they walk together, etc. And we saw the effects of sin is that after the fall, man hides from God, and God is searching for man. That's, that, that's the difference. That's the difference. And it's a difference with the significance. Uh, God also initiates the covenant. God initiates in the Old Testament three great covenants. Okay? Covenant with Noah after the flood. Secondly, the covenant with Abraham, and thirdly, the covenant, the so-called Davidic covenant, that out of David's line will come the Messiah. Now, a covenant is not a contract. We have, we have to bear that in mind. A covenant is not a contract. Uh, a contract is basically a judicial, a legal document that lists a series of do's and don'ts requirements, obligations, of which if any one party violates them, there are penalties, or the other side is of their own free will, etc., can extricate themselves from the contract. That's, that's simple enough. A covenant is much more interpersonal, it's much more relational, and it's much more open-ended. It doesn't have a whole list of do's and don'ts. Uh, children at a certain stage love contracts. They're very, very much aware of uh, their rights and responsibilities. Uh, David, help your sister put out the garbage tonight. First response is, it's not my turn. <laughs> uh, that, that's a, no, that's a very basic fundamental level of justice. It's not my turn. It's not fair. That's a contract, because they're saying, look, Pop, we have a contractual relationship. Dad is asking little uh, wayward David there to enter into a covenant. Take it out because your sister's not feeling well. Take it out uh, because she has other things to do, because she's helping your mother. We can go on and on. But our little... Uh, little David there, uh, he, he wants the contract. The father is saying, enter the covenant. 
We're all in this together. We quote, we don't have these limitations. Hence marriage. We can treat it as a civil contract, a series of do's and don'ts. We even have prenuptials. In case you're married to a gold digger, huh? or a cougar, or something, God only knows who people marry. But uh, given that, uh, we want to protect ourselves. But a covenant relationship does not have that. Uh, some people want to live covenants. Look, this is my duties as a husband, this is what you can expect from me as a wife, and so on and so forth like that. And beyond that, uh, look, I'm not involved. We want, it, we want it clear and distinct. But a covenant relationship, if it's truly sacramental, God doesn't enter into contracts with us. God enters into covenant relationships with us. It's open-ended. It, 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 it's, all, it's all involving, all encompassing. Uh, that, that, that's, that's what it is. And this is a shocking thing, that God, would enter into a covenant relationship with the people, with the people he has chosen. This is like, oh, again, God's self-revelation, God's self-involvement. In other words, God is not a deistic God. It's not a deistic God. It's not the God of the Enlightenment. It's not the God who creates the world, winds it up according to its natural laws, and then it just runs on its own, in which God has no involvement, none at all. That's why the Enlightenment thinkers and many of the founders were very skeptical of things like miracles. You mean God enters the world and starts fooling with this? No, 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 no. Because why? The Enlightenment is the very time in which the scientific revolution has really taken hold. And they wanted God in there but they couldn't have the God uh, that was involved like that because it went against the scientific ethos or culture of the time in which God was basically the watchmaker, put the parts together, wound it up, and said, okay, you're on your own, kids. That's it. It's very different. It's very different than the God of the Bible, and it's very different than the Christian God. God is not a watchmaker. He's not an engineer. He's not a contractual partner. God is a God who lovingly enters totally and completely with the incarnation into a supreme, total, eternal covenant. We say that all the time at Mass. I don't know if we pay attention to it, but we say it. Huh? The new and eternal covenant in the body and blood of Christ. It's a covenant. We don't say the, the eternal covenant, the eternal contract. We don't say that. The, 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 that would hit the ear, most people anyway, wrong. So God enters that in, his, in terms of his revelation. And not only does God enter there, but God also, because it's a covenant relationship, God also enters human history and the lives of his people through the gifts of the prophets. The gifts of the prophets. Because what do they do? They break the covenant. They worship other gods. They don't practice social justice. Uh, they intermarry. They do all of these kinds of things, so on and so forth. They break the covenant. But God could have said in a contract, injustice. I wipe my hands of y'all. Hey, have at it. Go ahead. You violated the contract, you, you, you pay the consequences. Sorry. I don't have anything to do with y'all. But no. Through the prophets, God calls them back again and again and again and again because God is faithful even though they are not faithful. Because God's behavior is not dependent upon human action in its ultimacy. In its ultimacy. God will respond to it. But God's response back back to the Noah covenant with the flood the rainbow is God's sign of the covenant of life never again will I destroy the whole earth this particular way 
never again. That's the covenant with Noah. Okay. God, as St. Paul says, God cannot go back on himself. God does not speak against himself. If God is faithful, God does not speak uh, in an unfaithful, take my word back way. He's not that. Once made, that's it for God. And we, we're all over the place. But God does not, like Pilate, wash his hands, say, I'm done. No. God, again and again and again, wants to turn hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, responsive hearts. God's love is not only faithful, it's tenacious. It's tenacious. It's persistent. And the only sin that God cannot forgive, as Jesus says, the only sin God cannot forgive is the sin against the Holy Spirit. What is the sin against the Holy Spirit? God, get away. I want nothing to do with you now, ever. Leave me alone. I'm not getting into this. I quit. You say, well, why doesn't God? No. Because then what you want is, you want a God who's a tyrant. That's what you want. Then immediately you would cry out, well, God doesn't respect my freedom. Oh, no. God respects your freedom. God respects your freedom. You make that decision, and you say, God, I don't want anything to do with you. Well, God is not a stalker. Okay? You don't have to get a restraining order. All you have to do is tell him, I don't want it, I'm not buying it, I'm out. And in your, but you see, that's part of your dignity. See, that violates your dignity. If God forced you, if God coerced you, rather than persuaded you, God would violate your dignity as a human being because he would not respect your freedom. And with freedom comes responsibility, answerability, accountability. So you can't have it both ways. We want freedom, but we often dread freedom. See, uh, as Jean-Paul Sartre uh, says in his famous essay, Existentialism is Humanism, he says, man is condemned to freedom. Now think about that for a moment. Just, just let them, they, they don't you know, think about that. Man is condemned to freedom. My God, we cut our teeth on that. Liberty, freedom. When the French were deciding what gift to give to the American people as a sign of their friendship and gratitude for all that they did and so on and so forth, there were two arguments. One side wanted a statue of equality and the other side wanted the statue of liberty. The people voted and their representatives for the Statue of Liberty. We, 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 love, we love freedom. Sartre says, oh no we don't. Not really. Eric Fromm, in his great, great little book, Escape from Freedom, he says, <laughs> he says we talk freedom. But we, we, we have a lot of qualifications about it. What we really mean is don't hold me responsible. Get me off the hook. Get me the out of jail card. Somebody come rescue me. You know, we have Toys R Us, the store that would always never go out of business. Alibis R Us. You know, that's what Well, I'm this way because my genes are bad. My daddy tried to breastfeed me. He was confused. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, my mother dropped me on my head. I don't know. Uh, you know, what, what, my zodiac was in the wrong sign today, in the wrong house, or wherever they end up. I, I don't know. They, you know, uh, no problem. Uh, it's one of those things. Yeah. Uh, see, freedom, freedom is not free. If by freedom you mean, let me do what I want, when I want, how I want, and don't hold me accountable. No. That's treating you less than human. 
That's why one of the most insulting things you can do to somebody is not hold them accountable. Not ask them to be answerable for their behavior. Some people discipline and love their dog more than they love their children. They do. Why? They discipline the dog. Now please spare me the idea of brutality and all this other kind of stuff. This is the nonsensical argument that whenever you say something, people run it to the extreme as somehow it's a disqualifier. The abuse of something is no argument against its proper use. Name me one human thing you can't abuse. There is none. There is none. Therefore, what you should do is get born, stay in the crib, and never get out. Because everything, everything can be abused. Everything can be misused. Uh, every profession has its bad eggs. Uh, every tensile that we use, everything that we use, this can be used to film this. This can be uh, used to film uh, some kind of pornographic uh, activity, and so on. It can be. Everything. There's nothing human that cannot be perverted but it doesn't qualify us from its proper use. And so discipline, accountability, answerability is a sign of respect for the dignity of the person. And we ought to love our children more than we love our pets. But some people believe that if I do that, I'm being cruel, I'm restraining their creativity, I'm not allowing this to take place. Oh my God, I'm a horrible parent. And especially I cave in when my child says, I hate you, you're not like the rest of the parents. And we go, oh my God, my child hates me. I'm a bad parent. Uh, it, 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 it's incredible, it's incredible. But often that happens because parents want to be pals instead of parents. Children do not need pals. They have enough pals. They have enough peers. What they need is a loving parent. And that's a blessing. You want to have a real dysfunctional dog? You want to have a real quote unquote bad? You know, Father Flanagan said there's no such thing as bad, a bad boy. There's no such thing as a bad dog. They're rotten owners. And those are the owners that do not discipline their dog. Dogs want discipline. If you have a pack of dogs, you have a pack of dogs, and the dogs are out of control. Because there's one dog in there that's unstable. And that's a dog that's never been disciplined. And animals attack, attack instability. Animals will attack that dog because that dog is the source of the problem. Therefore, you don't go after the dogs here and there. You, you gotta be able to look at the dog that is the source of the energy of instability and you have to discipline that dog. And watch what the rest do. They go from 10 to 2. They stop. Same is true with human beings. You ever been at a meeting? Go to a meeting, and if the meeting is disruptive and cantankerous and wild, ask yourself, who's the unstable one here? <laughs> Who, who's the unstable one? That, that That's the one that has to be addressed. Because that's the one, that's the one who has polluted the atmosphere. That's the one. Same true with human beings. Same, especially with children. Especially with children. You do children no favor, you do your pets no favor, and you do one another no favor. Now discipline, I'm talking about as the Bible does. Fraternal charity. Fraternal respect. I'm not talking about dressing somebody down in front of the group and all this kind of stuff. I'm not talking about Again, stay away from that kind of foolishness. I'm talking about loving discipline. And you're willing to risk short-term disapproval and anger for a greater long-term good for that person. That's what you're willing to take. I'm mad with you. I hate you. That's fine. You'll get over it. It's okay. In about 20 years, you, you'll be doing the same thing to your children, so shut up. <laughs> no, you know. So, 
God does that because God loves them. And the supreme revelation, of course, is the incarnation. The word becomes flesh. You can't get a deeper commitment, a deeper covenant than that. This is totally and completely incomprehensible to Greek philosophy, and we'll see that. <laughs> uh, that somehow God, eternal, perfect, self-sufficient, all of that, all-knowing, everything, wants to become a human being with our finitude, subject to the law of temporality, decay, old age, falling apart, the fact that we're messed up as beings, we're not perfect, we don't know it all, contrary to what some think, and all of that. Why, why would God ever want to become this? My Lord, it's called love. It's called love. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Not to judge the world, but to save the world. John 3, 16. Okay? So, this, this God, this God, is a God who reveals himself. Okay? Now, uh, and we see this, we see this throughout. Um, now, you say, well then, if we have this God who reveals himself, etc., then why, why, why do we need this? Why can't we just run on revelation and get over, get over it? Well, a lot of reasons. But one obvious reason is, is because everybody, better watch. <laughs> I have borders here. It's obviously, a Trump voter. You know, it's a Trump voter. And here I am, you know, trying to get across the border. Uh, I want to be shot. Uh, and uh, so, uh, the idea uh, being that uh, there's a whole bunch of folk who are never exposed to the Bible. Who would never catechized. So what do we do? Throw them into hell? But they have an invincible ignorance. They have an ignorance they can't overcome because they've never been exposed to it. Can't expect them to know what they've never been exposed to or taught. Uh, you know, that's unjust. Uh, you have that. You also have some people who are exposed to very wrong presentations of the faith. They have very messed up images of God, stories of God. Great uh, Protestant writer, J.B. Phillips, wrote a wonderful little book called, Is Your God Too Small? And uh, in that book, he goes through the various images of God that people have. And he says, the problem with Christians is their God isn't big enough. They have this little picky you God. Do this for me, do that for me, could you do this? Oh, give me that, don't let it rain on the picnic, and all that kind of stuff. And so God becomes a kind of Santa Claus or indulgent parent or a kind of doting grandparent or something like that. Uh, is that really the God that was revealed in the Old Testament in the person of Christ and so on? We, we downsize God. We don't ask the big things. Uh, fascinating little book. Anyway. Uh, so, there's a, so, for this reason, and there are those who also uh, don't buy into this religion stuff. They don't buy into it. Okay. What they do buy into is the importance of reason. God, to them, doesn't seem reasonable. Not reasonable. Why? Because God doesn't fit into the scientific method. You can't you can't uh, quantify God. You can't touch him, hold him, like you do another person or an object, like a desk or a chair or a book. Uh, he is he is beyond 
my ability to quantify, to measure, to encounter as another human being, or an inanimate object, a chair, a desk, etc. So it becomes kind of incomprehensible. Now, if you could show me that there is some reason for God, then okay, I'm in. Therefore, there's a whole approach to this question of God. It's called natural theology. This is God without revelation, but it's God. It's a theism. It's a belief in a God, but it comes about on the basis of reason alone. Okay, comes out on the basis of reason alone, absent revelation. So don't go to your Bible, please. Don't go to don't run to the Bible. I'm going to talk about it in terms of reason, and. <clears throat> Perhaps the most famous presentation of this, and it's terribly, terribly uh, mis misunderstood, mislabeled, and everything else. It comes from, of course, as you might suspect, St. Thomas Aquinas. And it's commonly referred to as the five ways. The five ways. And invariably you will see the five proofs of Thomas Aquinas for the existence of God. Please understand, they are not proofs. They are not proofs. You cannot prove the existence of God by reason alone. Because then if you if you if I can prove God exists right now, why do we need faith? We don't have any faith anymore. Get rid of faith. I don't have I don't have faith that this is a desk and it's here and I'm bumping up against it and so on and so forth. It's empirically verified. And in fact, it's also verified by you. It's not a mirage. It's not an oasis in the desert. I, I don't have faith that this desk is here. I know it's here. I know it's here. And my behavior is adjusted accordingly. I don't keep trying to walk this way. I don't, unless there's something wrong with me. In other words, I'm going to step to the side, and I'm blocked there, so now, oh, but now I'm going to go over there, see, because this lady looks much, much more friendly than <laughs> this side, you who know, looks rather grumpy and whatever, whatever It's on the right side, too. Uh, it's because I made a little mistake with the border, you see. <laughs> probably the uh, INS agents. Anyway, um, so uh, Aquinas says at the end of each of the five <coughs> declarations for God's existence based upon reason. And yet, it doesn't matter what he said because it's going to be labeled the five proofs. It's not a proof. He says it is therefore reasonable to conclude that God exists. And that's, that's the biggest thing. It is reasonable to conclude. He doesn't say this proves the existence of God. It doesn't. But it's reasonable. It's within the realm of reason that a reasoning person can come together and entertain the possibility that there is a God. And that's what he wants. See, if I can convey to you five reasons for the existence of God, of which you can conclude 
reasonably so, that God exists. And therefore, and no, no, I haven't brought in faith. I haven't brought in the Bible. I haven't brought in any religion books and all this other kind of stuff. I, I, I'm completely unarmed with that stuff. I'm asking you to think it through. That's what I'm asking you to do as a rational being. That's why he says, it is reasonable to conclude that there is a God. Is it possible that someone at the end of this will say, I still don't believe in God? Yes, yes, yes. But I would then say, well, what is the grounds for you saying that God does not exist? You say. Now, uh, <clears throat> Uh, what uh, what are the uh, by the way Aquinas uh, and this is in the Summa Theologica section one of the Summa Theologica and the Summa Theologica was written the whole of the Summa Theologica one of the greatest things ever done between 1265 and 1274 1265 to uh, 1274. The first one he offers is the argument. That word is also ignored. The word is argument. Not the first proof. The first argument. It's from motion. Is from ocean. Now, remember, please, Aquinas is pre Copernicus. So we're going by the cosmology that they understood at the time, of which the Earth was the center and the planets revolved around the Earth. But they moved. Planets are inert. They're not living things. The question is, do they move? Yes, they move. Let's leave aside Copernicus for a moment. We're not debating that. The planets move. Planets move. But the planets do not have an ability to self-start. Therefore, who started the motion? Who was the first mover that started all of this going? Because there's many things that are either inert, lack the capacity, etc., and yet there's motion to them. And if they can't start themselves, there had to be some force, some reality, that was the first mover, but itself was not moved. Hence referred to as the unmoved mover. Because that which moves is greater than that which is moved. You understand that? That which is moved, that which moves is greater than that which is moved. Because that which is not moved and cannot move on its own. Does not have the capacity to move me. Doesn't have the capacity for that. A greater force has to come along to move me, to push me to the side, or to move me by, oh, somebody's hurt outside. Well, we all run outside. That moved me, one physically, the other, emotionally, out of concern, etc. But it acted upon me. It acted upon me, so therefore it is greater. It has more power in being than that which is acted upon. Therefore, not only is there a first mover, but the first mover must be unmoved. It must be unmoved. Because if you have something that moves the first mover, then the first mover is not the first mover. 
that which acted upon the first mover uh, is the mover. Think of the dominoes. They don't fall by themselves. They don't have the capacity. You say, well, the wind blew them over. Okay. Then they, didn't, they still didn't move on their own. They moved because a force greater than theirs acted upon them. That's what happened. And if I take my finger and I do this, and they I am the first mover. I'm the prime mover. But I myself am not moved. I am not falling over. I'm not a domino. There's only one domino in the world, so that's domino. <laughs> so the first thing is from motion. Motion has to have a first mover that itself is unmoved. That's number one. Okay. Number two is the argument from efficient causality. Efficient causality. Efficient causality is the cause that brings something into existence. That's the efficient cause. Efficient cause is that which brings a thing into existence. So parents are the efficient cause of what? Their children. Very good. That's exactly right. They're the efficient cause. They're the efficient cause. Uh, you put together a model, or you paint a painting, or you write a book, or whatever you whatever you do put something together and you create it. You create it. You're the efficient cause. You are now. Everything in the material world is not capable of producing itself. We are not sui generis. We are dependent upon a previous cause for bringing us into existence. You are dependent on your parents. Your parents are dependent upon your grandparents, and so on and so forth, and on and on it goes. Uh, all that exists was not capable of producing itself, including human beings. We don't produce ourselves. We're not self-producing. We are dependent upon a first cause that itself is not caused an unmoved mover and an uncaused cause. Because if something produced God, then that would be greater than God. That would be God. You see that, I hope. So it's, it's not complicated. So this is what you have. So here you have motion with an unmoved mover, an efficient cause, that which is responsible for what is, what exists, but itself is uncaused. Itself is uncaused. Because the cause is greater than the effect. The cause is greater than the effect because the ca cause is the one that brought the effect into existence. Okay? Therefore, there had to be something that brought all of this into existence from the beginning, without which nothing would exist. For the great philosopher of uh, the uh, 17th century, Wilhelm Leibniz said the most fundamental question in philosophy is, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? And don't go run to your Bible, because that's, that's, that's ruled out. See? Uh, and uh, so you 
have to have you have to have a cause that's uncaused to account for the fact that there is existence. There is existence. But itself must be uncaused. Yes? So again, very, very basic, very, very simple. Uh, the uh, the next one is from uh, the argument from being. Contingent and essential being. A contingent being is one that need not exist. A contingent being is one that need not exist and at a certain point will go out of existence. In other words, all human beings are contingent beings. I hate to break the news to some people. The world does really not need you. Sorry. And in fact, the world will continue after you're pushing up daisies. Okay, and there are some people who believe that the world, as soon as they die, the world is coming to an end. No, no, in all likelihood, it will continue. And even if it did, it has nothing to do with you. You just happen to be uh, an accidental happenstance, okay? So a contingent being is a being that exists, will go out of existence. But a contingent being means it's not necessary for existence to continue person says, I can do without you. That means you're contingent. I can do without that. I can do without you saying that to me. It means I can go along quite well without having you say that to me. In other words, I'm going to, I'm going to continue to exist. And a person who is grieving for someone and says, oh, I don't think I can go on with my life. Well, of course you can. I realize we don't say that. But in terms of philosophy, yes, you will. Yes, you will. Uh, because that person is a contingent being. Again, let's not drag religion into this. That person is a contingent being. That person will die. And over a period of time, most of us, not everybody, we will continue to exist perhaps not in the same way, not with the same degree of light, of, of zest and all of that kind of stuff, we'll miss them. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in for that. But you're going to exist. And then at some point you'll join your quote-unquote loved one. is dead. It's dead. Because the, it's the sand does go through the hourglass. Such are the days of everybody's lives. So you're a contingent being. However, we also know that there must be a necessary being, an essential being, what we call necessary. Otherwise, at some point, the end game is extinction, non-being. Because there must be a being that is necessary and not contingent in order to keep existence going. And that is reasonable because it must be God, who is eternal, the fullness of being, and a God who keeps things in motion, keeps things caused, and keeps things in existence, being ongoing. Hence, we sometimes refer to God as the supreme being. Supreme being. Because God is necessary. He's not contingent. He's not a contingent being. In other words, in every contingent being, 
There are two things in play in every contingent being. Potential and actual in relation to in relation to being. Being the word being huh, is from the infinitive to be. Being is existence. Same as we talk about. Being is existence. To be means you exist. Okay. In every human being, there is potential and action. I look at you and I say, let's see, um, so and so in this class, let's make up a name, Jane has great potential as a student of philosophy. What I've also said is she hasn't actualized that potential. She is deficient in being. Why? She's just starting. So is she deficient in the philosophy? Yes, yeah, she's just starting. Actualized means it's present. It's there. Uh, you tell someone, you, you, you get a child that comes into into the into the office and uh, they've been cutting up or carrying on or something or another and you say and, and, and you try the uh, good cop approach oh Johnny you have so much potential what you're saying is you're wasting it you have potential but what haven't you done you haven't actualized it you haven't brought it into being at that level it doesn't have existence. And you're wasting it. You're wasting it. But for things to stay into existence, in God, there can be no potential. In God, there is no potential. God does not have great potential. So that, that argument is not going to sell with God. Oh God, you're great, but... Yeah, and just think, you have so much more potential if you would just do this for me, you know. God's not buying the Kool-Aid, okay? Uh, in God, everything that is, is actualized. It has to be. Because if you said God had potential, God is deficient in some fashion. Therefore, he's not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. It's not all whatever you want. Uh, you see. So God must be that being in whom the fullness of being is, supreme being, in which there can be no potential. God must be that being in which everything that exists is already is actualized, and we are participants as finite, limited contingent beings our life is a life of the unfolding of our potential and more and more becoming actualized and to the extent in which you actualize your potentials is the extent to which you fulfill your humanity if you have things talents and abilities and gifts and you don't use them you don't develop them you are going to be miserable and why? Because you are not being your being. That's the key. Simple put. Simple put. Be your being. Be your being. What does it mean? Be an actualized human being as much as you can. And to that extent, you will be happy. To the extent that you neglect the development of your humanity, 
is the extent to which you will be miserable. You will be miserable. You can call it the wasted years, the wasteland years, this, that, whatever you want. It's wasted. It's wasted. Many people come to the end of their life filled with regrets. Why? For all of the things that they could have done and didn't. All of the potentials, all of the actualities that could have been realized, and they didn't. They neglected it. Whether that be spiritual things, whether it be relationships, whether it be some talent, some gift you could have given to you, whatever it is. And as Erickson, Eric Erickson, the great psychiatrist of the last century, in his eight stages of psychosexual development, says, the last stage comes at the end of life. It's the stage of integrity. To die with integrity, what does that mean? Integrity from the word integration, the bringing together. It does not mean that you lived a perfect life. Get away from this perfectionism. We're not talking about perfectionism here. Perfectionism can often degenerate into a severe psychological impairment. Believe me, this is usually uh, coupled with control freaks who have to control everything. You know, God spare me those. All right. So you have, you have these people who come to the end of their life and they say, my life wasn't perfect, but it was really good. And I really feel that I've won some small victory for humanity. Somehow the world is a little better because I took up space and I breathed some oxygen. Some lives are enriched, not perfectly, not completely, not totally, all of that. That's not, the, that's not the benchmark. But overall, overall, adding the pluses and minus, credits and debits, and all that kind of stuff, I've lived a good life. And I can die with the peace of integrity. I have integrated, integrated pretty good, pretty well. That's what I've done. See. And so, like, so there is this being, this necessary essential being that keeps everything in, 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 into, uh, into existence. Into existence. And then there is the argument from gradation. Argument from gradation. That is, there are degrees. There are degrees in which being is actualized. Degrees to which being is actualized. Very simple. Very simple. We're going to have we're going to have a test in here. Okay, that we're going to do. We're going to have a test. And the test is uh, a penmanship test. Okay? And we're gonna have we're gonna have three prizes. First, second, and third. That's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna judge. Because my handwriting is so wonderful. Okay? <laughs> Looks like I'm having a, a seizure, doesn't it? <coughs> but it's, it's better on paper. Okay. Uh, the idea being we use the words good, better, best. We recognize in our everyday life that there are degrees of being. Being means evidence, evidence of. We recognize excellence. We recognize that was pretty good. We say that, that was pretty good, that was okay. You go to school before we got crazy, huh? And you had A, B, C, D, F can't do that anymore because children get uh, traumatized and then have to go to a life of Prozac. But okay, <laughs> Le leaving that alone. Uh, so, and, 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 and the nuns, those of you 
uh, of an ancient age such as I, every Friday would take the work of the week and you would have either a gold star or a red star. If you had a red star, when you got home, you had something else that was red. <laughs> Usually where you sat. Uh, if you had a gold star, well, you couldn't wait to run home. Oh, God. And uh, some crafty kids in the classroom, for example, would buy and find out where you got gold stars and red stars <laughs> and put the gold star over the red star. And so then the nuns, ever adaptive, that's why they would get their um, red pen and put everything that you did wrong in red and so on and so forth like that, you know. They gave you a test of uh, 10 questions and you got a 90 on the test, you got one wrong. What was the mark on the paper? The red X. You said, wait, I got nine right. I respect to get nine right. Shut up. <laughs> no, it was a code that they had, I'm convinced. That uh, the parents, and you know, that they go, aha, this red thing. Why, why, why did, you know, if you had a tyrannical father, he would say, hey, work on that, work on that X. Get that right, and so on and so forth like that. Uh, we recognize that. There are degrees of excellence according to some norm or standard. For example, in baseball, baseball, you want to get in the Hall of Fame, hit 300 over your career. You're going to get in the Hall of Fame. Do you realize that means you fail seven times? Baseball's a wonderful game because it teaches you how to deal with failure. The hardest thing in sports is to hit a baseball. You're hitting a round ball with a round bat that's dipping, diving, curving, breaking away, all of this, going sometimes now in excess of 100 miles an hour, 60 feet, 6 inches. It's an, inc it's an incredible sport. It's, it's, it's the hardest thing in the world to do. A athletes who play other sports will tell you. They've, they've tried baseball. Michael Jordan, Mr. Basketball, all that kind of stuff. Tried baseball. I think he lasted a month or two. It's incredibly hard. Three, three, three hits and ten, ten at bats, you're in the Hall of Fame. Win 300 games as a starting pitcher. Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Uh, we recognize that. That's why we have a Hall of Fame. We don't have Hall for the ordinary. We have a Hall of Fame. I think. And so we recognize that there is an order within nature, what philosophers at the time called, and still do to some extent, the chain of being. That is, how much does this entity realize and maximize the activity or the nature of what it is, the degree. We give out awards. The outstanding student of the year. What are we saying? That student achieved an outstanding level of actualizing what it means to be an ex a student. That's what we're saying. We're not saying the other students are bad. The students are rotten, no good. We're not saying that. We're saying that this person, either by study, work, maybe they were gifted, maybe they came from a good home where that was emphasized. It doesn't matter that that. What matters is that it was recognized by competent authorities, the teachers, the school, sometimes even peers, if they're not blinded by jealousy, peers will say, she deserved it. She deserved that award. She deserved to win. That was the best essay, etc. We recognize that. That's not demeaning to someone who happens to be part of the pack. 
You know, you got these bumper stickers. You see these goofy people ride around with. My child is an honest student or a scholar at this place. I want somebody to please, for God's sake, get a bumper sticker that says, my child is in the middle of the pack, and I thank God because the child is normal. <laughs> you know, you can only have a parent or a grandparent. You know, you see these grandparents, they drive around in these cars, you know. You know, one, one little immaculately conceived daughter or son is not enough. It's, it's spread down. You, know, you think the immaculate conception was just the blessed mother. You're very wrong. Well. <laughs> Obviously, you had not been in school. Uh, ask, any, ask any any teacher who has to sit there with a the parent who believes that their child was immaculately conceived. Oh, God. It's an amazing thing how this is proliferated. So we recognize gradation, that there's an order of being. Well, this order of being, this chain of being, and it begins with what? A supreme being. It has to begin with a supreme being. Whatever you want to call it, supreme being. Why? Because the supreme being has actualized everything perfectly, completely and wholly. Because it is the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause, the essential being, in which there is all actualization and no potential. And it is the being who has to be at the top in order to achieve all of that. And therefore, next to the chain of beings, the supreme being, we have spirits. It has to be spirits. The uh, spirits around the planets, uh, demigods, things like that, uh, they, are, they are closer to the source of being, the supreme being, but they're not quite there. And underneath there, you have human beings, because they have reason and free will. But, but because they have bodies, they're limited. They're limited unlike spirits. Spirits are not bound by space and time. Your body, following Plato, is a tomb of the soul. Uh, your body is a limitation. Sorry. You cannot be here and wanting to watch the basketball game on television at the same time. You can't. You have to be either here or there. And we say that, don't we? Stop yelling at me. I can't be in two places at one time. We say that. Yeah. Uh, and I can't be in two places at the same time. I'm limited. Spirits are not limited by that because they're not corporeal beings. But human beings are higher than next. Animals. Animals are next. They have an animal soul. Aristotle and Aquinas. <clears throat> there is the rational soul, the vegetative soul, the animal soul. Animal, well, human being. After all, what is human being? Homo sapien. The rational animal. You have animality. You're an animal, zoologically and otherwise. Uh, you, you have hunger. You have thirst. Uh, you reproduce. Uh, you feel pain. But you're also a rational animal. Homo sapien, rational animal. An animal that has wisdom. Uh, you're, you're humanoid. Animals feel, are hungry, uh, <clears throat> they reproduce, they do those things. So you share that with them, but you have a higher level on the chain of being. You're closer to the supreme being, in the chain of being. Now we're leaving aside the crazy people who think, you know, there's 
offices under the ocean who have laboratories and uh, libraries and bloodless surgery and all of that kind of stuff, advanced civilizations. We're leaving those people alone for a while. Uh, they're, they're not. So you have that. Uh, then you have vegetative, vegetative being because they reproduce. Some of them have locomotion. Hmm? Four o'clocks, they open and close. You have the uh, what? The uh, fly trap contraption or whatever. Something goes in it. Boom. They so they have locomotion. They reproduce, etc. But they don't have the level of being that an animal has, a non-human animal. They're further down. And, and the last on the bottom is mineral. That is all the things that are innate in animal. This, this thing is at the bottom. This death, this pen, etc. Uh, it doesn't reproduce. It doesn't feel. It doesn't eat. Uh, it doesn't reproduce itself. It's not thirsty. It's none of those things. Whereas the others need that and have that ability. Therefore, far the way you are, and from that, far the way you are, from the source, the supreme source of being, you have less of being. You have less of being as you go down. Uh, we see that in human beings, don't we? We see that in human beings. You have a, uh, you're going to have some kind of function in an office. Maybe even a formal activity. End of the year something or whatever. Well, you have the quote unquote place of honor. And that may very well be the founder of the firm. It may be the president, the CEO whatever. And sitting up there on the right side may be the guest of honor. The guest of honor does not sit at the end of the table. The guest of honor sits up here. We don't have the guest of honor in the middle of everything. No. Because the guest of honor is there emanating from the one who was sitting at the head there, the founder, the president. But this person, by sitting there, is closer to the source of the fullness of it. And the person who's sitting way in the back, you know where all the Catholics sit at Mayo, way in the back, okay, they are further away. They are further away. That's why when you go to a meeting, you see some people jockeying to sit close, close to the front. They, 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 they want to sit, you know, if, 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 if the head honcho or whatever it is, potentate or whatever, uh, is sitting there, oh my goodness, you want to sit there, there, there. You don't want to sit in the back on the end. You know, unless you're hiding and you have to give a report and it's terrible and well, you're not prepared. That's another thing. But, but you see that. Jockeying, in order to get those positions, to get that place in line, that, pay, that, that place up front, so you can be heard, you see. So the chain of being is something quite familiar. Uh, we have a chain of being in the hierarchy with animals, don't we? We sure do. You have a group of cats, or you have dogs, or something like that. There is a pecking order. We call it the pecking order. We have it. Which one dominates? Which one is submissive? Etc. You see that? We do that with children. 
Oh, he's outgoing. He's, he's effervescent. He's this and that. Lord. Uh, then, then you have the other one who's more recessive. Quiet. Mainly because the poor child can't get a word in because you got all the lunatics uh, after, the, after this one that's so wonderful and terrific. And then they want to know why the child is living next to the wall. Well, as far as he can talk. Uh, so you have that. But we recognize it. Or you have some in a family. Some are more assertive. Some show more initiative. Some are more outspoken. Okay, we take that as part of their personality and their development. And we need all kinds. We need all kinds. We don't need a, a, the screamers all the time. We need a more reflective type. Uh, and so we recognize that. Okay? So uh, there, there are those differences. And, and we recognize the one who takes initiative. I'll do that. I'll do this. You have those. And then you have those who have to be called upon. We see that in the business world. Oh, you can count on him. Don't worry, it'll get done. Uh, it'll get done. Yeah. No matter what ha what needs to happen, they will do it. And then you have, oh God, Joe is, God, if you don't tell him, he doesn't do it. And when he gets finished, he stops, and so you got to tell him what the next job is. He sees these things on the floor. You think he would pick them up? No. He just walks right past them. And so on and so forth like that. So, well, in our world, we praise the one who shows the initiative, and we get frustrated somewhat with the person who seems to be lackadaisical, disinterested. It may not be that. That simply may be their temperament. The great philosopher William James, the great American philosopher, one of the greatest. He said, all philosophy is temperament. Either you're an optimist or a pessimist. You're either hopeful or you're very subdued and kind of look on the dark side of things. So, uh, we, we recognize that. We recognize gradation. And the final element is the argument from design. Last Saturday, last Saturday morning, for those of you faithful ones, who showed up for 7.30 Mass to honor the Blessed Mother. Those of you that didn't, that's between you and the Blessed Mother, and she knows, so don't start saying your rosary. It's too late, and she's not listening, by the way. You had your opportunity, but didn't show any actuality. Okay. And you have much less being the opportunity to be heard by the Blessed Mother. I might be my name. But leaving that aside, that little theological uh, problem, um, when you went into the church at for the mass, the per, the place looked like it had been hit with an atomic bomb. I think that's true. You had all kind of things covered. You had sand and God, I, I don't know what it was. Something something that was bad for you. All over the pews, all over the end, the whole. The, Chairs were someplace else. This was cut. Oh, it was it was a grand mess. It was a mess. And if you happen to show up at the four o'clock mass, okay, and you look walked into the church, you were doing this. What what happened? What happened? And if you ask me, and I said. What do you mean what happened? He said, well, I was here this morning. I was one of the faithful ones devoted to the Blessed Mother, unlike some. And uh, maybe you didn't say that, but okay. You get the idea. And the place was just a disaster. And now it doesn't look like the same place. What happened? And I say, oh, nothing. 
that, that would strike you as bizarre. What do you mean nothing? The church this morning was was all discombobulated. And now look look how well it looks, good it looks. What happened? Well, obviously, if I said to you, well, the church fixed itself, you would say, you need to. You need to talk to more than the Blessed Mother. <laughs> you need to go right to the top. You have a deeper problem than we thought. Um, no. You, you would be irrational. Uh, because nothing in the church can fix itself. It doesn't have that capacity. The pews cannot move themselves. The floors do not clean themselves. The tarps and all of that do not remove themselves and get all the stuff out. Move there, there, there is now a design in that church that allows the function of a church to proceed. But there had to be an antecedent. Intelligence. At work. Not to simply put it in an order. Or not simply to clean it and, and just move things out the way but they're now arranged in a design that is now conducive to, to worshiping Almighty God as Catholics, called the Mass or the Eucharist. Well, we realize that this didn't just happen by itself because it doesn't have the capacity to do it. There had to be something outside of its ability to do it in order to bring that order and design appropriate to its function so that it could go forward from what it has been to what it is. It doesn't have the capacity of the being. It cannot be its own efficient cause. It requires an external cause, an external efficient cause to come in with an intelligence and an understanding and a reason and a rationality so that it was proper to its function. Form follows function. Hence, we know, leaving church for a moment, human beings have a design. a common design. It's called human nature. And we do not design our own nature. We're trying to. But it's never completely and it often ends up in disasters. We have a given human nature. And that human nature is designed in such a way that you can do things like modern medicine. If you didn't have design to your nature, you could not do human medicine. There would be, there would be no hospitals and doctors. You'd go back to uh, medicine men and chance. It's only because the body has a structure, a predictability, common to human beings, that we can talk about specialties. We can talk about the kind of doctor you go to the kind of things that can be prescribed. We can talk about a zone of probability within which X will bring about Y and so on. With safety, high rates of curability, high rates of relief, etc. But that didn't just design itself. Now, if you're an evolutionist, which is interesting. You say, well, you gotta, well, you're just working your way up to faith. Okay, let's take, let's take the two major theories of cosmology today. First theory, the Big Bang Theory. That is, there always was this kind of cosmic stuff, this kind of primordial gook that was there. And over billions of years or whatever, 
it managed, it managed to just happen to come together into a kind of golf ball that becomes, with the passage of year, billions of years, tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter till eventually the pressure inside of the gook and the outer covering, the inside became so great that what did it do? Boom! It exploded. And it exploded until you have this world. That's what you have. In other words, the world was haphazard. It was created by this big bang, this primordial big bang of billions of years ago. And now that everything has kind of cooled down and formed and all of that, this is what you have. The big bang. The other theory is the slowly evolving universe. It started out with a kind of primordial soup, but it kind of developed over billions of years in which life forms developed and grew into mingling with each other, various forms in the atmosphere and in the cosmos and all of that, various elements taking place came together in this particular fashion. We don't know why, we don't necessarily know how, but it came together. And this is what you have. Now, now, the person who wishes to criticize the person who believes in a religious faith, let's say Genesis, they say, oh, that's just faith. That's that religious stuff. But I'm supposed to believe that billions of years ago, what well, was always here, that this kind of cosmic golf ball came together. How? I, I don't know. Why? I certainly don't know. But it just happened. See, that's not an act of faith, by the way, is it? It just happened to come together. And the pressures just happened to be such that it then exploded. And it just happened to explode so that we have human life and we have all of the mountains and the trees and the shrubberies and the ant. And all of that just kind of took place. Why? I don't know. How? I have no idea. Or... There was this cosmic soup that just kind of evolved. Why? I don't know. How? I don't know. And it just happened to just kind of, you know, like Campbell's, you know, they just kind of hit the right, the right thing and here we are. But that doesn't take an act of faith. Some people think it takes an act of insanity. Uh, one person's faith is another person's foolishness. The act of faith that is dismissed because you bring in the Bible is, is, is then embraced by all of those who take the quote-unquote scientific theory and give you, I don't know why, I don't know how, but it just happened. So it's the faith of chance. And that's okay. And no one sees a problem with that. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, we recognize the zone. And we also understand there is something within us that craves design. Because as the church fathers used to say, the first rule of heaven is order. The first rule of, of heaven is order. What is the first thing that God does in the Bible? The Holy Spirit hovers over the water and there's nothing but chaos. And the Holy Spirit, the spirit, the breath that is hovering over there, it begins to establish order. Let there be light so then there's order that can take place. 
It has to be order. Most of us do not like a, a disordered life. You don't like a disordered desk, a disordered home. Most people don't anyway. One sign of mental illness is disorder. Is they have no sense of direction, purpose, or meaning. They're just kind of scattered. I don't know. Uh, nothing makes sense. Nothing fits. We don't like that. Why? Why? Why are puzzles uh, so attractive? You know the old time puzzles. We like to put those parts together. We, we want to order. We want to see pattern. We we are the human being that can see pattern, order. Uh, you know. of a lot of detective work and police work. Uh, what's the, what, what, what kind of crime was it? Are there any common clues, any common patterns of how the crime is committed, where it's committed, when it's committed, in, in what manner is it? Is it strangulation, shooting, stabbing, poisoning? Uh, if somebody has lost, uh, you know, four spouses in two years, uh, <laughs> And uh, you know they've all met quote unquote untimely deaths. Uh, even uh, even uh, Mr. Magoo could, could begin to think or see you know or Jacques Cousteau or whatever uh, could begin to see that hmm I think there's something here. Yes, it, you know it's 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 no longer coincidental. And you look at that for a serial we call them serial killers serial killers. Well, they call them serial because there's a pattern that develops there. That's the basis of just basic detective work or police work. We also may do it within terms of behavior, uh, our own behavior, because very often we're, we're the most ritual animals in, 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 in creation. The, the thing is we often don't recognize it. 
That's why criminals are so effective. What do they do before they rob you? They case your house. They find out when you leave, when you return. Who comes, when? And they may do that for a month or more. Things that you're not even aware of. You have to leave at 7.30. You take the same route every, every day. You come home for lunch at the same time. You, you take a walk at 8 o'clock at night with a little uh, goofy fifi. Uh, and then if your wife is tired, you bring in the dog. No. Uh, <laughs> bad joke. OK. So uh, you have that. Uh, and we just kind of do it. Many people can't sleep unless they go through a certain bedtime ritual. I can't sleep unless I say my prayers. I can't sleep unless I brush my teeth. I can't sleep unless I watch this program. I can't. Uh, we have certain quirks and things that we do that we're not aware of. Doesn't make us crazy. Not about being crazy. Not, not crazy at all. We're ritual beings. We like patterns and repetition because it gives us a certain sense of security. It gives a certain sense of, of, of repetition so that we know what to expect, especially if you happen to be a person who doesn't like surprises. I, I, I want to know what the plan is, what, what the thing is. There's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're responsible for people or you're responsible for a project. It's good to anticipate. Every good lawyer has a plan B. And what will the lawyer tell you? Never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. And if you're a client, the one thing you cannot do ever, and you will be dropped and should be dropped, never lie to your attorney. Because if your attorney is supposed to defend you, and you go into court and you're hiding something, the prosecutor will find out about it. Someone will squeal. Someone will uncover, rat you out. And he looks like a fool, your lawyer. You have no credibility. So it's just a question of how much jail time you're going to get. Because you're done. Lawyers will tell you, you know, look, I need to know everything so that I'm not blindsided. We want that, and it's, and it's necessary, necessary. We can't wake up every morning with a whole new thing in front, a whole new world, a whole new uh, laws of motion and physics and chemistry and all that. We'd, we'd, all, we'd all be crazy in a second. We seek order. Order is the first law of heaven. God sends the spirit so that they can start the progression the progression of creation, culminating in the being of the human being, made in the image and likeness of God. That being to the being. I'm going to stop. At the end of this, hang, hang with me. At the end of this, Aristotle, I mean, uh, Aquinas does not say. Therefore, I have proved the existence of God. He says no such thing. He makes no such claim. Go read the Summa Theologica. Go read the thing on the proofs for the existence of God in the Summa. You can get it, I'm sure, on one of those contraptions. And just go look at it. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude. It's reasonable. I'm not saying you convince. You may leave here and say, I'm not convinced that that junk. He's crazy. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. But I'm asking you to think about it. And what you are dismissing, explain to me by your explanation. That's what I want you to do. Don't, don't, don't stop with just dismissing me or Aquinas. That's lazy and irresponsible. Tell me, tell me why this is not reasonable. I didn't say, and I did not use the word proof. Why doesn't this prove God? You're asking me to do what Aquinas said he's not doing. So I'm not carrying that water. I'm saying it's reasonable. I'm not asking you to, to believe how many angels are on the head of a pin. I'm asking you to look at your experience. Look at your everyday world and in your own life and are not 
these elements present to some degree and are reasonable and in some senses very good without which you would have serious injury to yourself or others or you'd have a very chaotic world. That's all I'm saying. That's all Aquinas is saying. Because again, this is natural theology. I haven't said a word, I haven't said a word about the Bible. I haven't said a word about three persons in one God, the real presence, redemption, incarnation, paschal mystery, ascension, coming of the Holy... I haven't said anything about any of that stuff. Nothing at all. I haven't said anything about it. I'm simply asking you to reflect as a rational being and say, is it reasonable? Is it reasonable that one can conclude that there is a God or a supreme being or a supreme intelligence? unaided by revelation that one can come to. That's all I'm asking. And that's all natural theology is asking. But again, well, well why, why, why are we even talking about this? Because reason is that which presents faith in a coherent orderly and systematic way so that it can be discussed and rationally talked about and exchanged with others especially since the founder of the firm told the first uh, members of the board of trustees go out into the whole world and preach the gospel live the faith and make disciples of all peoples and all nations until I come again. Well, if you have this universal mandate to go forth to the whole world, and the whole world was bigger than Jerusalem, you cannot afford to dismiss reason, and especially in today's context. You cannot afford to dismiss reason. And you will see from the very beginning, the church embraced the idea of reason tied to faith. Now, for next time, what the, uh, how much time I have left? <laughs> oh, 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 I'm, 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 I'm stopping. I just want to get this. I am. I am. Uh, next time, I'm going to go over the uh, two sources of uh, the one Catholic tradition, which is very different than classical Lutheranism and the whole Protestant approach to theology. And we have to understand that. Um, so I'm going to give you kind of an extensive thing to do, which you probably won't do, but that's okay. That's why I believe in miracles. Okay, here we go. What I'd like you to do, please, is to, from the Catholic Catechism, because it's, so you have to bear with me, if you're interested in taking it down, if not, that's fine. Uh, I'd like you to uh, look at Catholic Catechism, numbers 27 and 36. 27, 36. Numbers 38 and 50. Catholic Catechism 85, 86, and 87. Please. In the Catholic Catechism. And what I would like to ask you to do is the following, which is really to kind of have you lift it. Okay. It's not really, but it will probably seem that way. I would like you to research the following, please. Now, when I say research, I'm going to offer you two ways to do this, please. One will strike you as truly unreasonable and bizarre. The other way you will embrace, I'm sure. Uh, the way
way that will be embraced is the way of going to one of those computer things. That's number one. That's the way you're going to do it. But, but however, <laughs> hope springs eternal. I am going to hope, invite you, implore you, beseech you to make a trip where most moderns have never gone before to the library. <laughs> it is a wonderful thing to go into a library. I don't know what they are now, but the old libraries, and you had the smell of books, and you had the Nazi behind the desk who were the librarians. <laughs> was great. Our great fear was is that you were going to check a book out. <laughs> and, and, and all of this kind of stuff. Li li libraries are wonderful. Uh, just a few ideas about as one fellow said, Google can bring you 100,000 answers. A librarian can bring you back the right one. Virginia Woolf, great writer of the 20th century. I ransack public libraries and find them full of sunken treasure. Mark Twain. Good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience. There is the ideal life. And finally, many more, but finally, Albert Einstein. The only thing that you absolutely have to know is the location of the library. So I invite you to take a trip to the library, and I would like you to look up the following, please. These names. You don't have to do extensive things. I want you to know, get a feel for it. See, what I want you to do is not just to get these people that we're going to talk about and somehow print on a page or something collecting dust in a museum somewhere or an intellectual curiosity. I like you to get to know them. Know them. Know their idea. Because they're still with us. They, they're still haunting our everyday world. We don't know it, but they're still there. Some thousands and thousands of years. Number one, please. Thales, T H A L E S of Miletus. T H A L E S of Miletus, M I L E T U S. Thales of Miletus. Secondly, Anaximander. A N A X I M A N D E R. Anaximander. A N A X I M A N D E R. Next, Pythagoras. P Y T H A G O R A S. P Y T H A G O R A S. Pythagoras. Heraclitus, H-E-R-A-C-L-I-T-U-S, Heraclitus, H-E-R-A-C-L-I-T-U-S. Parmenides, P-A-R-M-E-N-I-D-E-S, Parmenides, P-A-R-M-E-N-I-D-E-S. Next. Democritus, D-E-M-O-C-R-I-T-U-S, D-E-M-O-C-R-I-T-U-S, Democritus. Next, skeptics, S-K-E-P-T-I-C-S, the group of philosophers that followed the atoms. S-K-E-P-T-I-C-S, skeptics. And next, sophist, S-O-P-H-I-S-T-S, S-O-P-H-I-S-T-S, -S, sophist. And the final two things, if you would, please. Look up the philosopher, the great philosopher, the great American philosopher, William James. That's easy, William James. That's his name. And... He is the 
associated with the uh, original contribution of America to philosophy, pragmatism. Pragmatism. William James and pragmatism. And the last one, Carl, K-A-R-L, not C, K-A-R-L, Carl Jaspers, J-A-S-P-E-R-S, 20th century, great influential philosopher. K-A-R-L, Jaspers, J-A-S-P-E-R-S. And his concept of the axial age, A-X-I-A-L-A-G-E, axial age. Yes, sir. After skeptics, skeptics, skeptics. Scott, sophists, sophists, sophists. S O P H I S T S. S O P H I S T S. Does he have that? Do you have that, sir? Yes. Do you have that, sir? Well, look, 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 no, no, listen to me, okay? I, I'm still kind of doing this. S O P H, you hear that? Yes, S O P H. I S T S. You hear that, sir? Okay, good. All right, anybody else need a, a reboot? I wanted to be modern. All right. Uh, let's let's end with a prayer, please. Thank you for your patience and attention. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.